Hey, welcome back. Uh, tonight we're going to talk about an example uh, looking at what happens when we sample a continuous time signal to get a discrete time signal and what that, uh, how we follow that through in the frequency domain. But the idea behind sampling is if I have a continuous time signal, I'm going to turn it into a discrete time signal by saying my discrete time sequence or signal is equal to the values of the continuous time signal at some fixed interval t, where we call capital T the sampling period. Right, and then we sometimes say the, the omega s, which is 2 pi over t, is the angular or radian sampling frequency. And sometimes we also say F sub S is the linear sampling frequency, right? This will be in radians per second. And this will be in, this is the linear sampling frequency. That will be in 1 over seconds, which we often call hertz. Right? So it's more familiar. It turns out... The math is often a little easier to work with with omega s's, but as engineers we often work with hertz. So you need to get a little comfortable with both. And just for a picture of what this looks like, right, if this is my signal xc of t running along here, and then I go sample it, what that's saying is I'm, I'm going to make a new signal in discrete time, which I'll, I'll represent as the blue signal here, where I'm just grabbing the continuous signal spaced by t seconds. So on the t-axis, which I'll put in white, this would be at 0, t, 2t, 3t, and then going backwards I have minus t and minus 2t. When I get to my discrete time signal, though, these things have all have to be integers, right? So these are essentially 0, 1, 2, 3, and minus 1, and minus 2. And the big picture question that comes on here is, is, is always about, well, when, when are these samples enough to capture all the information that was in the continuous time signal, right? This signal, in one sense, looks like it has a huge amount of information because it's defined at every possible little t, every time instant little t, of which there's an infinite set. But under the right conditions, which is when this is band limited, we find that having signals that are frequent enough is, is, is all we need to capture, right? So if fs is greater than two times the highest frequency, an xc of t, or where both frequencies have to be in hertz, or I can do them both in angular frequencies, then x of n right, contains all the information that we need to reconstruct the original continuous time signal. So I can go back and forth. And this is sometimes called the Nyquist or the Shannon sampling theorem. And this is a huge underlying idea for all of our digital audio. This underlies our ideas for digital audio, digital video, and high definition TV or digital television, and so on. So what I'm going to, this is sort of a quick overview. Let's look at a quick example. I was going to use this signal up here. I'll just I'll draw it again on the next page. An example of how do we get from the spectrum from one to the other. We went through this in class. And there's uh, sort of three steps to get the discrete time Fourier transform. from the continuous time Fourier transform when sampling. Right, and it turns out, as we saw in class, this is a hugely important idea because in the frequency domain, it's much easier to see when we have all the information. And again, those three steps, the first step is that we put copies of the continuous time Fourier transform, where again I'm using little omega to mean continuous time frequency, every 
2 pi over t, or, or which is the radian or angular sampling frequency. The next step is that we uh, scale all the heights by 1 over t. And that turns out to be the least important thing, just the gain, that there's a gain term that comes out of sampling. And then the third point is that I th then uh, multiply the frequency axis, that's the little omega axis, by T, capital T, to get the big omega, which is, this is again, to, to be clear, this is the continuous time frequency, and this is the discrete time frequency. Okay, and so that leads to an equation, equation that comes up over and over and over again, which is that discrete time frequency is continuous time frequency times the sampling period. Different books may use different notations for different omegas for which one is continuous and which is discrete, but this form always stays the same, that discrete time is equal to continuous time times the sampling period. And so these first steps come about, turns out, from the, the very active sampling. This makes the extra copies, and this helps us determine where there's aliasing. And then this comes from rescaling the time axis. If we go back to the previous page, right, that what was labeled every t, we, to get to, oops, I should have labeled this. This is the n axis in blue, right, to make these integers, we had to divide the time axis by t. And we've seen by now that whenever you do something one way in the frequency domain, it goes the other and the time and vice versa. So if we divide the time axis by capital T, we're going to multiply the frequency axis by capital T. All right, and so, and the, but the really important steps in this one here, I would, I would say, if you're really going to focus, the gain isn't that important. You really want to make sure you, when we get this, get this right, get these two steps worst, right first, and then worry about the height as sort of a last step if you need to. So let's, uh, let's go on to a new page here and, and look at or an example. So imagine our continuous time spectrum. It's this kind of half circle, and imagine it goes from plus or minus, and continuous time frequencies, plus or minus 2 pi times 100. So this would actually be 100 hertz because right, I divide angular frequencies by 2 pi to get radian frequencies, and this is height 1. And so if we're going to go through those, and imagine I sample it, where t is going to be 1 over 300, or so fs, if I work out from that, is 1 over t, is 300 hertz. So the first quick check I pull is I say, well, the, max frequent, the maximum frequency here would be uh, 2 pi over 100, right? It's a band-limited signal. That's the maximum frequency. If I want it in hertz, I need to divide that by 2 pi, because this is an omega axis, and I want a hertz. And so this should satisfy the... There should be no aliasing, right? Since fs is greater than 2 times f max. So that's a good first step. Now let's see how this works out when I go through and sample. So I'll try to keep, if I can, try to keep this sort of to scale here. So we put copies every 2 pi over t, which would be, well, the first one is still centered at 0. So I still have a copy here at 2 pi over 100 and minus 2 pi over 100. Again, this is my stretch it out my omega axis. And then my next copy would be up here, this point here, omega s, this would be 2 pi over t, which is 2 pi times 300. So my next copy would be centered here. I'm sort of make it, trying to keep it a constant width. That's what I had a minute ago. It would be about this wide. I end up with another one here if I can draw it well. So 
right? And so this right edge, sorry, this so I should have been clear. This frequency is here. This point here, I say, well, this was two pi to a hundred to the left of zero, and so this point has to be two pi times a hundred to the left of that. So this will be at two pi times two hundred, and this will be at two pi times four hundred. And as I keep going up, I'll get additional copies, right? I'll have another one that's here at 2 omega s, which is 2 pi times 600, and similarly another one that extends it periodically in this direction. So that gets me through step one. That's my copy, step copies every 2 pi over t. And this is already where we see there's no aliasing, right? There's nothing overlapping between these copies of the spectrum. So I, haven't, I don't have them interfering with each other, and I don't lose any information. The next step is we say, well, if the height was 1 before, right up here I have the height was 1, it's now going to be 1 over t, which is 300. So step 2 is to realize that all these things are 300 tall. And then step 4 would be to multiply the t-axis, draw another version, Let's scoot this up some, oop, whoa. Right. The step three from the previous page, oh, too far back, this one, is to multiply the frequency axis by t. And so when I do that, I'll get another copy of almost the same thing. So give me a second while I fill that in. producing it very well, but you get the idea here. That I still have all my little little semicircles here. But now this point here is still at zero. Multiplying this by t, this point here would be 2 pi times 100, and then t is 1 over 300. So that's going to be 200 pi over 300, or 2 pi by 3. And similarly, this will be at minus 2 pi by 3, because the whole thing is symmetric. And this point here will be 2 pi times 300 times t is 1 over 300 will be at 2 pi, which is exactly what we want to see, because we know discrete time spectra repeat every 2 pi, right? Because the time index has to be an integer. We've seen already that the, uh, the spectrum has to repeat every 2 pi. And so another way to think of it is that multiplying by t is, or dividing the time axis by t forces everything to be integers in time is what forces this to be periodic every 2 pi. No matter what t is, I put this copy at 2 pi over t, then I multiply the frequency axis by t, this will end up here. So here's my frequency axis when I'm done. For this case, uh, this one would be at 4 pi over 3. So I've drawn a lot of copies here, maybe even more than I need, to give you a very complete picture. Usually we just worry about if we have something that's about 2 pi wide, so we might just go from minus pi to pi normally and worry about this copy. If we really want to be careful, we'll go from minus 2 pi to plus 2 pi. But this shows you again through the three steps of sampling that I put copies every omega s, that's 2 pi over t, I scale the height by 1 over t, and then I relabel the frequency axis to go from little omega to big omega, that is from continuous time radian frequency to discrete time radian frequency, I multiply by t, and I get this version of the periodic spectrum. So there's your, your sampling steps and what goes on in the frequency domain when we sample. All right, good luck.